India is of course known for its wildlife, it's the land of the tiger, land of the elephant. Many of our gods ride peacocks or tigers. Uh, that's all in the past. Actually, uh, right now, the wildlife in India is in a real crisis. Our protected areas are under severe threat. And the equation that existed between people and wildlife centuries ago has vanished. And now our tiny protected areas are mere islands amidst a sea of people with a tremendous amount of demands and pressures being put on them. The most urgent threat to wildlife habitats, wildlife in India is actually the pressure from illegal hunting or poaching. Uh, we have still a substantial amount of forest left in some of our areas, but they are empty forests. The wildlife in them has been killed. Uh, the killers come in a variety of ways. They may be local people hunting for the pot. They may be using snares. They may be using guns. Or they may be the lowest link in a massive international mafia of wildlife trade, which is today almost as big as the drug trade. It is a common misconception that a poacher is always a man with a gun who goes and shoots an animal and you've got to go and stop him. Actually poaching takes place in very many different ways. The poacher often is a very harmless looking, humble looking person operating quietly in the forest. The poacher sets snare on trails used by animals. These are simple snares made of telephone wires which can kill a deer or even a tiger. Deadfall traps are set, jaw traps are set. Some of these are extremely cruel. But one thing is common to all these other forms of silent poaching. It's very hard to detect them. You can hear a gunshot, go and try to corner the poacher. But a silent, silently set snare, a poison carcass or a deadfall trap, nobody will know. You don't even know it's going on, but it's going on all over the country in our forest on a massive scale. Illegal hunting has severe impact on wildlife. It depresses wildlife populations. Uh, for example, animals like deer and sambar and elephants get hunted down to levels below which their populations are not viable. It has secondary effects in terms of uh, if the herbivores, the deer and the uh, gaur are killed, ultimately a tigress which requires to make about 50 kills or 60 kills a year to survive won't be able to bring up her cubs. So the third thing is when we take animals out of a wildlife community in this manner, we are not even sure what the impact is. You may be taking out a species of civet or a species of bird that is crucial for pollinating a tree or dispersing its seeds. So essentially we are dismantling at random a very intricate piece of machinery that nature has built over millions of years. So hunting is a devastating threat. Sometimes a uh, view is held that, you know, if you educate local people about the need to save wildlife, they'll be very benign and they will take care of wildlife. I think this is a simplistic view. A lot of killing of wildlife takes place because there are criminal elements involved. There is a trade involved. And these are the kinds of people who are not going to simply sit there and listen to lectures and smile and go away. They are going to be around, they are ruthless, they are very well armed. And the only thing that works with them, like it does for example with rhino poachers in Kaziranga, is enforcement. Patrolling, anti-poaching camps, well armed guards willing to take on the poachers. In those situations it's almost like a trench war between the organized poachers and the wildlife protection staff. So while education is helpful in the long run, it does not do away with the need for serious and strong enforcement. One of the dilemmas that India is facing 
in trying to save tigers and elephants and lion-tailed macaques and all these highly endangered wildlife species is the problem that there are settlements and people inside some of the protected areas. Unlike in the heartland of uh, rainforests of Borneo or in the Amazonia, we are not talking of very, very primitive cultures who are simply living off the land at very low densities of 4 to 5 people per 100 square kilometer. We are talking of agricultural settlements, people with aspirations for agri uh, carrying on agriculture, improving their economic status, for raising livestock, to generate cash incomes. Uh, essentially, someone who needs all the services that you and I want, which is hospitals, schools, roads, communications, bridges. Now, if you try to deliver all these social services, all these employment opportunities and economic development to the heart of our protected area system, we are certainly going to lose a lot of the wildlife there. So to me, the solution is very clear. The services and the economic development that these people are demanding must be provided to them. On a voluntary basis, in a very attractive package, it has to be offered to them outside the protected area system. On landscapes which are adjacent to parks, maybe even away from them. It's well recognized that timber felling damages forests. But do you know that if you take even dead trees or fallen trees, which are full of nest holes and cavities, a lot of species get affected, although the tree looks pretty useless to us. For the wildlife community that uses it, even a dead tree is a very useful resource. And then there are the so-called minor forest products, MFP or non-timber forest products. Now this could be bark of some species of trees, it could be the fruit of some others, it could be the seed from a third one, or it could be simply products like cane and bamboo. Now, all these products are now reaching, being exploited, not for somebody's own consumption, like a primitive man living off a few roots and tubers. They are now going out to organized industry that is catering to a huge and growing urban middle class. Take, for instance, the honey collected from the forest. It gets labeled, it gets exported, it ends up on a middle class dining table. Same thing with the phyllanthus or gooseberry fruits. Uh, barks of many trees like the cinnamon tree or the machylus tree go to feed the big industry of agarbati or incense sticks. Debarking these trees actually kills the tree itself. Uh, a variety of these products being exploited has several implications to the welfare of wildlife. Some of the things like gooseberry uh, or uh, let's say silk cotton flowers are food items for wildlife, often used in times when the habitat is very stressed, say in summer or when the grass is dry. By depriving them of these nutrition at these critical times, we are having very adverse effect on wildlife, its health, its numbers in whatever way imaginable. The other thing that minor forest product exploitation does is the method of exploitation itself is very dangerous to wildlife and forest. Many of them involve destroying the tree or the plant, many of them involving a heavy usage that affects regeneration, many of them, uh, many of the minor forest product collection methods are brutal. For example, use of fire is a common thing to collect various kinds of fruits and nuts Use of fire is commonly associated with minor forest product collection, honey collection. So the impact of even this very innocuous sounding activity is quite hard on the wildlife habitat. Fire in a natural landscape has a lot of complex effects. But what we are talking about today is very different. Our protected areas form less than 3% of India's landscape. And there are no large landscape to sort of take into effect the long-term effects of fire. We are talking of small areas 
being repeatedly subjected to annual fires and these are not natural fires as it is say in the case of North American forests. These are all man-made fires caused by graziers, minor forest product collectors or accidentally caused by hunters. So all these fires, repeated fires have a severe and negative effect on the forest. What it does is gradually remove many kinds of trees or understory plants which are not able to withstand repeated fires and replace them with hard thick barked often ed inedible kinds of plants which are able to withstand fires. Secondly, fire directly has a tremendous effect on ground nesting birds, reptiles or even of young ones of animals like deer and tiger. So the effect of fire essentially is a negative one and we need to treat it as such. The protected areas are tiny islands, they are like ice cubes out there melting in the sun, the pressure is on and we need to be very clear that uh, we need to say hands off these protected areas. This country has a history of thousands of years, obviously there are a lot of social injustices and human rights abuses that have gone on over this vast landscape, but do you think by sacrificing this 3 percent will be able to make any dent on the real problem. If the problem is something we have not been able to solve in 97 percent of the land, I am convinced that it cannot be solved by sacrificing this 3 percent of the land that is in wildlife protected areas. We need to look at these protected areas very differently. If Taj Mahal for instance is dynamited and broken up into pieces and the stones used to build a housing colony, I would call it stupid. Even then, Taj Mahal can be rebuilt if you have a good design and a plan. But these intricate ecological webs and the wildlife species that form a part of that matrix, once we destroy them, there is no bringing them back.